or practicing it in the middle path or the middle way. Between indulgence and sensuality on one side and self-torture on the other. Although it might be better to think of the middle path not lying on a continuum halfway between those two points. In other words, we're not here doing a little bit of pain and a little bit of pleasure. We're trying to find some state where there is no pain or no pleasure. We're actually trying to raise ourselves above that continuum, because the continuum basically on the one side takes sensual pleasure as an end in itself, and the other side sees pain as being something inherently good. And said so the Buddha wants you to use these things for something that's even better. We use just enough sensual pleasure to get by in terms of food, clothing, shelter, medicine. But we don't take sensuality itself as a part of the path. We try to find a different kind of pleasure, the pleasure that comes from concentration. This pleasure, the Buddha said, is blameless. In other words, it doesn't harm anybody and it doesn't fog the mind. The pleasure that comes from a centered and broad state of awareness actually enables you to see things more clearly. There is a lot to be learned about the mind by getting it to settle down. In other words, the process of getting the mind to be concentrated in and of itself requires some discernment. For example, when you're dealing with distraction. You want to figure out why the mind gets distracted, why it can lie to itself when it's about to run away and yet pretend that it's not going anywhere, it's going to stay right here. How does that happen? Why are there these different layers in the mind? And who's fooling whom here? Can you learn to detect the, the points where the mind is ready to go? It hasn't quite left the breath yet, but it's on its way. When you can do that, you've learned an important skill, and you've learned a lot of things about the layers in the mind, the layers of dishonesty, where one side of the mind is getting ready to do something and another side of the mind is pretending not to notice, the part that's complicit and yet would deny up and down that there's any complicity. That's what you've got to watch out for. And you learn to uncover that. You've learned some important things about the mind. And the same as you go through the various levels of, of concentration, you learn different ways that the mind fabricates around its object, how it relates to the sense of the body, to what extent the sense of the body is a creation. When things get very, very, very still, both in the body and the mind. You realize that the movement of the breath energy, the subtle breath energy through the different parts of the body is what creates your sense of where the body is. When that movement grows still, the sense of the boundary of the body begins to dissolve. And you have that choice of maintaining the perception of the boundary or dropping that perception. And you begin to see how artificial the whole thing is. That too gives you some important insights. So don't think that concentration practice has to be one thing and discernment practice is something else. In the process of maintaining your concentration, you're going to learn a lot about the mind. I'm trying to maintain this sense of being centered, having a sense of well-being inside.
It's not just a dead-end path, as some people seem to say. If you learn how to use it properly, you can learn a lot about the processes of fabrication of the mind. And that's what insight is all about, how the mind fabricates things, its sense of the body, its sense of the mind, how it fabricates speech. As you try to carry the concentration into the day, it may not be full absorption, but at least you have a center that you can try to maintain. Like that image of the man with a bowl of oil in his head. You're trying to balance this bowl of oil and you don't want to spill even a drop because the, the bowl is full. I'll try to maintain your concentration as you go into the day and you find that you're spilling it all over the place in the beginning. But it's important not to get frustrated by that, but to take it as an opportunity to learn what are the things that cause you to spill your bowl of oil. And don't blame sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile stations outside. It's the movement of the mind out to those things that spills the oil. And so what does the mind want out of sights? If you keep these questions in mind, you can learn an awful lot simply by maintaining your state of concentration or doing your best to maintain it. You see this flow of the mind outside. And if you look for it enough, you'll be able to catch it at times when the flow is about ready to go, but you're not flowing with it. You can observe it as something separate, and you begin to realize that your willingness to go along with the flow was what kept it alive. If you don't play along, it goes for just a short distance and then it drops. That too is, is an important insight that can be gained from sticking with the pleasure of concentration. So you use the pleasure. We're not practicing the concentration for its own sake, but, but it is a tool. It gives you a standard of measurement. It gives you a sense of well-being so that you're less likely to want to run out after cheap pleasures. And it gives you a standard of measurement. When you are very, very still, you can see very subtle movements. And when you have a particular intention that you carry into not only your meditation but also your daily life, you begin to see how that intention is knocked around by other intentions. And the more you're able to resist those other intentions, the more you see through them. Because that's the only way you're going to be able to resist them. You can't do it just through force of will. In the beginning, that's what maintains it, is your determination. You want this to work. But it's only by seeing into how the mind deceives itself that you're really going to have any solid concentration, a solid sense of center as you go through the day. So this is how we learn how to use pleasure. As for pain, it's a similar sort of thing. We're not here to pursue pain as a good in and of itself, but it is a useful means, it's a useful tool. As the Buddha said, if you find by living by your pleasure, unskillful qualities are beginning to proliferate in your mind. You have to be willing to make the practice a little more painful. This may mean giving up certain things you like, sitting for longer periods of time. Basically forcing the issue. Now, the pain is not going to do anything on its own. In other words, sitting with the pain doesn't burn away old karma. Or just trying to be very still in the presence of pain is not going to burn away old karma. But when you're sitting with pain, things are going to come up in the mind and you get to see them. You're forcing the issue. Your old habits that used to indulge very easily in the pain get frustrated, and particularly here in the West where we're trained to be consumers. 
and trying to things, have things come quickly. You want something, you just click on it, and it comes. It's good to have a few obstacles to your desire so you can see them. Otherwise, they blend into the background. They move under the water, and you don't have any sense of them at all. Similar principle applies to sitting with unskillful thoughts that are causing stress in the mind or a pain to the mind. Simply sitting with the thoughts and bearing with them is not going to do anything. You have to be inquisitive, figure out what about this thought keeps me attracted to it. Sometimes people think that if I think unskillful thoughts enough, I'll see the pain and that will get me past them. But that's often a trick of the mind. It wants to think the unskillful thoughts, so it gives you a, a sense of, well, by sitting here engaging these unskillful thoughts, I'm engaging in the path. But it's very rare that intentionally pushing yourself in that direction or allowing that to happen when you have other ways of dealing with it really impresses on you the fact that this kind of unskillful thinking is causing suffering. Because the mind does have this tendency to discount the suffering because it's enjoying the unskillful thinking so much. That's something you do have to watch out for. But if you can take an inquisitive attitude toward it, what here is the pleasure in this thinking? Why am I attracted to it? Why does it capture my imagination? What about it makes me feel that it's worthwhile? And you find that you're beginning to get answers to that, okay, then it's worth investigating. Otherwise, if no answers are coming up, it's a sign that the unskillful thinking is just going to run around, run circles around you. And so you've got to get the mind still. So figure out some way of extracting yourself from that unskillful thinking to get back to the breath. So again, pain is not an unmitigated good. It's a tool that you have to learn how to use. And when you can take this attitude both to pleasure and to pain, you find that it does lift you up above that old continuum of running back and forth between indulging in pain and indulging in pleasure and turning around and indulging in pain again. You're learning how to cut the loop. and realize that there are other alternatives. So often we get stuck in a situation where we think there are only two alternatives or three alternatives, and we run around the circle. And it's good to be able to imagine there are other alternatives that are totally outside of that circle. And it's often in those other alternatives where you don't have to choose X or Y. There are other choices out there. It's in realizing those other choices, that's where the path lies. <laughs>